We are continuing this morning in the uh, Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, starting in chapter 5, and we're continuing. And uh, just as a thought before we get into this, I just want to throw out to you, is salvation, getting saved, is that the totality? Is that all that there is? Is that all that's important? And is that all that Jesus came to do, is just save? And, and that's the end of the story. Uh, there in your bulletin, you'll see I reference Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 35. And I'm not going to read those this morning. I want you to think about that later, especially with what Jesus says to us here this morning in the Sermon on the Mount. Many uh, people have a Bible reading schedule. Do you have a Bible reading schedule? It's very good to have a Bible reading schedule because what's interesting to me is the way that you are just keeping on schedule. God sometimes uses whatever it is you read just randomly throughout the day, and luckily you read that just today. Have you seen that before in your Bible reading? Um, Oddly enough, long before Steve and I talked about doing the Sermon on the Mount, I started a Bible reading program, and just today, in my Bible reading, I had to read Matthew chapter 5. How did that happen? I'd like to believe that it was God just reminding me of the total context of Matthew chapter 5, and just reminding me of uh, everything I'm going to say this morning and keeping it in context. Many commentators believe that verses uh, 17 through 20 is the thesis thought. I would argue that verse 20 is the thesis statement. How many of you have ever had somebody take something you said and take it out of context? Every hand should be up. Remember that time you said da da da? I wasn't talking about that. I was talking about, right? We've all had that, right? I am of the opinion that absolutely everything that Jesus is about to say in the rest of the Sermon on the Mount, chapter, I'm sorry, verse 20, is important to keep it in its context. Uh, Matthew 5, 20, For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> When it comes to Scripture, perhaps you've heard the phrase, we interpret Scripture with Scripture. Have you heard that phrase? We interpret Scripture with Scripture. What does that, it sounds good, doesn't it? Sounds even pious, right? But what does it actually mean? Well, simply put, before we get into what we think it means, we let it tell us what it means. Does that make sense? We let it speak in its context. I have said this in my mind at various points. I'm, I'm a little more polite in, in my actual, but I've heard somebody quote a, a Bible passage, and I wanted to say, did you hear that? Like, I'm sorry, hear what? Nothing. Let's, let's continue. And they quote another Bible passage. I'm like, did you hear that? And they're like, what? And I'm like, it sounds like a passage being ripped out of context. But like I said, I'm more polite oftentimes in actual personality um, when that has happened. But I do believe that verse 20 here serves as our go back to. And everything that Jesus is about to say, I wonder if we should measure it by verse 20. Now, there's another rule when dealing with somebody else's text. And it's similar to the golden rule. We all know the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I don't just throw that out here in a couple chapters. Jesus is actually going to reference the golden rule, interestingly. But when we're dealing with somebody else's text, we need to treat somebody else's text the way we would want our text to be treated, right? So here, verse 20 how do we take this? What do we do with verse 20? It sounds like a challenge, personally, to me. Who's he referencing? He's referencing the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees are a very, very, very religious group. Very strict in their religion. Very outward, 
righteousness, right? And here Jesus is saying, your righteousness has to surpass that of this group that's recognized for their righteousness. That's pretty intense right there, Jesus. What do we do with this then? I think there are two ways to take this passage literally, so to treat it the way I think Matthew, I think Jesus, would like us to treat it. And the first one, I think, is the easier of the two. And that is to interpret this in light of the totality of Scripture, which would include salvation, which would include Jesus' righteousness being transferred to your account. Guess what? When Jesus' righteousness is transferred to your account, your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees. Yay! We dealt with the passage. We can move on, right? Well, yes, but... I don't think I'm being very faithful to the context of Jesus here. And then perhaps we should be a little more, well, what are you saying then here, Jesus? What do we do with this? Well, let's get into it before we figure out how we're going to deal with it. Beginning in uh, verse 21. You have heard it said... Uh, You have heard that the ancients were told, you shall not commit murder, and whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. But I say to you, this is the first, but I say to you, but I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. Does anybody happen to have a King James? Yay, one person! (laughs) Has a king, two people have a King James. Do I hear three? Three, pe- no, anyway, three people have a King James. If you have a King James, you will notice that it reads, anyone who is angry with his brother without cause shall be guilty before the court. It is very possible, because that without cause appears in later manuscripts, somebody took a manuscript and just added a note, a help for interpretation, and by the time the King James was translated, that had made it into it. Now, why would that be a good thing in this context? Jesus just laid down a pretty strict rule. Anybody who is angry with his brother is guilty. We all know that Jesus would never contradict himself, would he? Jesus was always meek, always mild, never, ever, ever angry with anybody. We like that picture of Jesus, don't we? Nice, happy Jesus. Actually, very few pictures actually show Jesus smiling, do they? But anyways, remember that episode, though, where Jesus walks into the temple and he sees the people selling and carrying on business in the temple? Remember what he does? He politely says to them, guys, I'd really appreciate it if you'd stop doing this. I'd really appreciate it if you'd take your commerce outside of the temple so that the temple can be used for its proper purposes. Remember that episode? That was a good episode, huh? Except that that's not how it happened, is it? Jesus started turning over tables of the money changers, and John says he made a whip, and he drove the people out. Does that sound like Jesus got a little bit angry at these people? So would Jesus contradict himself and say, you should not get angry, but when I get angry, it's okay? (laughs) I'm not sure that that's Jesus' mode of operation. I think that Jesus is talking about here without cause. There are times that anger is justified. Interestingly, what he says here as we go on, And whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. Now, don't think the American Supreme Court. Think more the Sanhedrin or the the Jewish High Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. That is some strong language right there, huh? Now, we're going to deal with the fool part first, and I want you all to put a pin in hell. We're going to 
come back to that topic here at the end, okay? But here, Jesus just said to even call somebody a fool is worthy to go into hell. But what does Jesus say here in a couple chapters about people? He calls some people blind guides, blind fools. Again, is Jesus going to contradict himself, or are we to read again, what is Jesus saying here, with cause, right anger, or just blanket, all things, except where Jesus does otherwise? I want you to remember that the next time they say, what would Jesus do? You say, make a whip and drive people out. <laughs> Verse 23, therefore... Interesting thing about that, and I wish I was this clever. I, I'm not this clever. I stole this from somebody else. Every time the scripture says, therefore, you should ask, what's it there for? Ah. <laughs> that means that what's about to be said here in verse 23 is directly connected to what has already been said. Therefore, if you are preparing... Your offering at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your offering before the altar and go, first be reconciled to your brother, and then come, present your offering. Jesus tells us the location. It's the altar. The altar is located in the temple. Well done. In the temple. And the temple is located... In Jerusalem. So you, since you're a follower of Jesus, are from Galilee or Nazareth or somewhere far away. You have come a long way. You have walked a great distance. You have gotten into the temple. You have gone through all purifications to make sure that you can go into the temple. You have gotten up to the altar and it's there that you remember your brother back in Nazareth, your brother back in Galilee, your brother far away from Jerusalem, and you have something between yourselves. And Jesus is saying, leave your, alt leave your offering right there at the altar and walk all the way back to Nazareth, all the way back to Galilee, all the way back to Capernaum, all the way back to wherever it is, reconcile first with your brother, and then come all the way back to Jerusalem, making sure that once again you're pure to go into the temple. You left your offering there at the altar, so now it's probably run around the entire temple. You probably have to go find wherever it ran off to, and you have to get it, and you have to take it back to the altar. Why? Why all of this, Jesus? After all, it's very, very popular in Christianity, American Christianity, and I'm going to even go further than just American Christianity to say that broad category of spiritualism that's alive in the Americas and the world, it tells us that all that matters is your relationship with God. That's all that's important, your relationship with God. And here you are, you're participating in the religion, you're making things right between you and God. And all that matters is between you and God. Yet Jesus is saying, not that it doesn't matter between you and God, but it also matters between you and others. It's not just a personal religion. It's not just a personal Jesus. It's not just about you and God. It's also you, God, and everybody else. That's kind of scary. That's kind of hard. That's kind of difficult. That's kind of convicting. Why? Well, go all the way back to Genesis, and you'll notice that God creates Adam and tells Adam, you will rule over the creation, so there'll be me, and there'll be you, and there'll be the creation. Good? Good. Except that that's not how it happened. God created man, and he created woman, both in the image and likeness of God, to co-rule over his creation. In other words, from the very beginning, it was not just me and God, it was me, God, and others. And going past the marital implications of they were naked and unashamed, taking that to the human 
essence of being together and being unashamed. Religion is not a personal experience. It's not simply between you and God. And Jesus is saying that your relationship to others is of the same style. It's of the same substance. It's of the same thing as your relationship with others. We're going to go down to verse 27. You have heard it said that you shall not commit adultery. 28, the second, but I say to you, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery in his heart. I want to go back again to the Old Testament. I want to go to 2 Samuel. I want to go to David. David is on the roof. He's walking around in the cool of the day. And he notices Bathsheba bathing. And he looks away. And he doesn't think about it again. And nothing happens to the Devaic kingdom from then on. He is always right with God. Everything is good. And the Devaic kingdom suffers no consequences for sin. Right? Wrong. Again, in my Bible reading, this was actually not in my original sermon, but my Bible reading took me to 2 Samuel and gave me this. And I asked some of my friends via text message, I said, how much time do you think elapses between verse 2, where Jesus, I'm sorry, where uh, David sees Bathsheba, and verse 4, where he commits adultery? How much time? We're not told exactly what the distance is. We are told that he has to send for her, so somebody has to walk over to her place and get her, and they have to walk all the way back, and then... So how much time? At least five minutes? Can we say at least five minutes has happened between verses 2 and verses 4? And at any point in that five minutes, David could have gone, you know what? This is wrong. This is wrong to the level that I'm breaking one of the top ten. Maybe I shouldn't do this. And had David not done that, wow, I don't know what would have happened. But what does happen is David's punished. And Israel is punished because of his sins. Now what happened? This is what happened. Long, long, long before verse 4, where he committed adultery, he had already committed adultery in his heart. That is something that just happens. But what's interesting here is going back to verse 20. Remember verse 20 where we find who we're supposed to be more righteous than. We're supposed to be more righteous than the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are very, very, very righteous on the outside. They like you to look at them and to see with your natural eyes their righteousness. Jesus is going so much deeper than external righteousness. I'm going to switch sins really quick just to keep things kosher and have a G rating on this DVD. How many of you like stuff? Stuff. Everybody has a hobby. Everybody collects something. Everybody wants something more. I don't know what yours is. I know what mine is. I've seen somebody else's thing, whatever it is, car, house, boat, boat. I would like a boat. <laughs> Stuff. Now, you could look at me with natural eyes, and I could hide that covetousness inside. And I could put on a brave face. And I could say, good for you. You got that new boat. So happy for you. <laughs> and you couldn't see that deep inside my heart, I'm saying, I wish that boat was mine. How can I get that boat for me? No. How can I get a better boat? than that boat. 
That happens way, way, way deep inside. And Jesus is saying that that is what he can see. And that is what he's talking about. He's going far beyond simply the external and going to the internal. Now Jesus uses hyperbole in our next section, and I'll show you why I think he's using hyperbole. Verse 29, If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it away from you. For it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be cast into hell. We'll come back to hell. Verse 30, If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it far from you. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Why do I think that Jesus is using hyperbole? Why do I not think he's being literal in this moment? Well, let's take him literal for a second, and let's imagine that you gouge out your eyes and that you cut off your hands. Let me ask you an honest question. If you were to do this, could you still sin? Yes, absolutely. Therefore, I don't think that Jesus is being literal. I think, though, that Jesus is giving us a very strong picture of how much we need to take sin seriously. What kind of steps we need to take to avoid sin and how we need to take those. Now, before we go any further, please, please, please do not come here next week with no hands and no eyes. Jesus is using metaphor here. But he is being very serious about sin and sin in our life. And that secret sin, that deep sin, that sin that you can't see with your natural eye, that sin that's only you and God know about it. Coming back to hell. The word used here in the Greek is Gehenna. It's a reference to a valley. Uh, in the Old Testament, it's called the Valley of Hinnom, and it's associated with worship of pagan gods in the Old Testament, specifically of human sacrifice to this god, and more specifically, child sacrifice to this god. Now, by the time of Jesus, this valley has kind of become the city dump. It uh, occasionally gets set on fire. And interestingly enough, outside of the biblical text, we have the Second Temple Jewish thought of using Gehenna as a picture of eternal judgment. We find it in the book of Enoch. We find it in several intertestimonial books, books that never made it into the Bible and aren't Bible. But we can see that the Hebraic thought at this time was that that burning trash dump is somehow connected to the end of time judgment for the wicked. Now, I have to ask you, does Jesus have a tendency to run into traditions that are wrong and tolerate them? The, is, is that his, his, his way of dealing with uh, when, when they've, they've taken truth, but they've skewed it, they've, they've messed it up? Does Jesus have a tendency to be very accommodating to false views? No, he really doesn't. And yet Jesus himself is taking this view that's very popular in Second Temple Judaism, and he himself is using it. He himself is endorsing it. He himself is saying that at the final judgment, there is some kind of punishment that you can understand through this use of the colloquialism Gehenna. Something that everybody in Jerusalem knows, something that everybody in Jerusalem can picture in their head. Now, is that not a scary thought? <clears throat> so, now that I have left you with that scary thought, we're going to end the service. Sound good? <laughs> no, no, no. What is all of this? Why do all of this, Jesus? What are you truly saying? Well, again, 
Our righteousness must surpass that of the Pharisees, must surpass that of those who are very good at having an external religion, surpass those who on the outside have the ability to look really, really good and to judge our hearts, to judge the things that we can even keep secret. You can't look at my heart. You can't see it. And I can even try to do things that would make you believe that my heart is good. My heart is pure. And that is that Pharisee. That is that external religion that makes you look good. Jesus is asking, what's in your heart? What is your true religion? And does your true religion surpass that of simply the external, simply the outside? Remember, I started this with, is salvation the end all? I don't think that salvation is the end all. I really don't. I think that change, I think that Jesus in you changing you, I think that Jesus touching your heart and having you have this kind of relationship with sin and relationship with with religion is what Jesus is saying and what this is all about.